e a todos. É... Hoje, então, nós teremos uma reunião especial, é, nossa reunião conjunta com a Universidade de Nebraska, nos Estados Unidos, e eles vão se juntar a nós um pouco mais tarde, lá ainda são 6 e 40 quase da manhã, então aí quando for 7 horas para eles, 9 horas para a gente, eles se juntam a nós. Essa primeira parte da reunião até então, a apresentação do artigo vai ser conduzida em português pelo fellow uh, Gabriel Bondar, e na sequência teremos a aula e discussão de casos que vão ser em inglês, ok, pessoal? Então a gente vai mudar aí o idioma no meio da nossa apresentação. Bom, então vamos em frente. Gabriel, compartilha aí para a gente. Então, bom dia a todos. Eu sou o Gabriel Bondar, um dos fellows do setor de óptica cirúrgica e agora na nossa reunião semanal. Vou mostrar para vocês uh, um artigo que trata sobre PRK topoguiado após transplante penetrante, após astigmatismo residual que aconteça após transplante penetrante e os desfechos a longo prazo. Esse é um grupo, uh, esse é um artigo que foi publicado uh, uh, na revista Córnea em janeiro desse ano, então é um artigo recente. A gente tentou pegar um artigo que, como o GAT tinha feito uma, um take-home message sobre tratamentos guiados, a gente quis, né, com vários artigos, a gente quis pegar um artigo mais recente, que não tivesse sido discutido. Um, esse grupo, então, é um grupo da Universidade de British Columbia, em Vancouver, no Canadá. E uma coisa que eu quero chamar a atenção aqui só, para a gente uh, né, uh, interpretar criticamente também o artigo, é que uh, temos conflitos de interesse, a princípio, nesse artigo. Uh, três autores, uh, dois autores são apresentadores, apresentam para a Schwind, um é consultor, e um outro autor, ele é o empregado da Schwind, uh, né, e inventor de algumas patentes do Amaris. Então, uh, isso é uma coisa que eu queria chamar a atenção também para a gente interpretar o artigo pensando que pode haver um viés uh, de desfechos positivos. Eu não tenho nenhum conflito de interesse para declarar. Bom, astigmatismo residual pode limitar a performance visual em pacientes que uh, realizaram uh, transplante penetrante e a lente de contato é um, método, é um método comum de correção nesses casos. Porém, o uso de lente de contato ele pode ser limitado por intolerância ou complicações relacionadas à lente de contato. E o PRK topoguiado nesses pacientes, ele até o momento foi apenas avaliado em, em estudos pequenos, né, necessitando de investigação. Então, a pergunta que os autores quiseram responder é se o PRK topoguiado pode oferecer a longo prazo correção refrativa de maneira segura em pacientes que apresentam astigmatismo residual após transplante penetrante dos métodos. É um estudo retrospectivo baseado em revisão de prontuário da University of British Columbia, em Vancouver. Os critérios de inclusão uh, seriam um PRK topoguiado após uh, transplante de córnea, isso realizado após uh, toda a remoção de suturas, e incluiu uh, transplante penetrante e também DALC. Na verdade, dos pacientes, só um olho foi DALC, todos os outros foram transplante penetrante. Tá? Uh, critérios de exclusão, uh, intervenção cirúrgica prévia para correção de astigmatismo, ablação parcial, que não objetivasse a hemetropia, olhos tratados antes de 2014, e isso foi porque era uma, uma outra plataforma de laser antes de 2014 nesse serviço, tratamento combinado com crosslink, que também foi excluído, e leito residual estromal inferior a 300 micro também foi excluído. É, eram 88 olhos, foram excluídos 34, sobraram 54 olhos de um total de 50 pacientes. Então, esses pacientes, eles eram uh, avaliados né, e depois tratados através da plataforma Schwind, todos eles foram com essa plataforma, com, através do Sirius, né, e depois do Amaris, com uh, o, o laser topo guiado. Bom, a avaliação pós-operatória era realizada através de duas consultas, né, foi avaliada através de duas consultas, um de follow-up intermediário, que seria com 12 meses, e sim disponível, então qualquer uh, consulta entre 6 a 18 meses depois de tratamento, e um follow-up final, que seria o follow-up mais recente, uh, né, uh, depois da cirurgia. A, a coleção, uh, a coleta de dados, então, uh, pré e pós-operatórios, incluía uh, os dados demográficos do paciente, a acuidade visual sem correção para distância, a acuidade visual com correção para distância, refração, equivalente esférico e o K. E também a presença de complicações pós-operatórias. A análise estatística foi realizada através do ANOVA, 
E a análise pós-rock foi feita através da correção de Bonferroni para a gente conseguir avaliar os desfechos em três uh, time points diferentes, que seriam a, a consulta pré-operatória, então antes da cirurgia, o follow-up intermediário e o follow-up final. De resultados. Uh, foram um total, então, de 50 pacientes, 17 mulheres e 33 homens. A idade média foi de 52 anos, com um desvio padrão de 2,4 e o alcance de 23 até 79 anos. E a, a média de, de, né, de follow-up intermediário foi de 10,5 meses, com um desvio padrão de 2,9 e o alcance de 6 a 18. E a média de follow-up final foi de 31 meses, com um desvio padrão de 17 meses e o alcance de 10 a 70 meses. Aqui são os diagnósticos pré-operatórios, isso antes do transplante de córnea, é, é para mostrar principalmente que o, o diagnóstico principal na, nesse estudo, dos 54 olhos, 33 uh, realizaram transplante por ceratocônia, então 61%. Bom, de resultados aqui também agora nos gráficos. Um, esse é um gráfico que mostra a acuidade visual corrigida para a distância e não corrigida para a distância né, em Logmar, Tá? nos três time points, certo? Eu coloquei também ali do jeito que a gente está mais acostumado a ver a, a, a anotação de acuidade visual. Em preto, a gente tem a acuidade visual, então, não corrigida para a distância. E a gente vê que no pré-operatório, a média era de mais ou menos 20, 180, que melhorou na visita intermediária para 20, 50, e depois ficou em aproximadamente 20, 60 no follow-up final. E isso com, foi detectado, assim, diferença estatisticamente significativa. Já na acuidade visual corrigida, no pré-operatório, era isso, isso corrigido eles definiram como correção com lente de contato rígida, eventualmente, ou óculos, né, o que ficasse o melhor possível. Então, a maioria, na verdade, era com lente de contato. Um, então, no pré-operatório, aproximadamente 20, 32, e não houve diferença entre o pré-operatório e o, o, o follow-up intermediário e o follow-up final. E os valores, se formos, formos olhar ali pelo gráfico, ficaram bem similares também. Uma coisa que eu quero chamar a atenção só é que após o tratamento, a acuidade visual sem correção, uh, ela não chegava a atingir, em média, o, a, a melhor acuidade visual com correção que esse paciente atingia com lente. Né? Então, um pouco diferente do, de pacientes que não tinham nem... Por exemplo, operar pacientes que não têm nenhuma patologia, que geralmente a acuidade visual sem correção chega, uh, pelo menos próximo né, ou igual à acuidade visual com correção. Aqui agora uh, uma, um gráfico que tem, basicamente, são quatro gráficos uh, com a mesma legenda, tá? esse é o gráfico A, uh, mostrando a acuidade visual sem correção também nesses três time points, é similar ao outro gráfico, tendo, havendo então diferença aqui do, 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 do pré-operatório para o follow-up intermediário e depois do, do pré-operatório para o follow-up final. E não houve diferença entre o follow-up intermediário e o follow-up final. Aqui, uh, de acuidade visual corrigida, então, iniciando com a média de 20,32 uh, 20, para operatório, uh, e não houve diferença também, uh, os valores, além de ficarem bem similares, também não foi detectada a diferença estatística para o intermediário e final, no follow-up. Aqui, de equivalente esférico, então, nós temos que, de pré-operatório, a, a média de equivalente esférico era de mais ou menos menos 2,5, certo? Isso melhorou para aproximadamente menos 1, havendo diferença estatística, foi detectada. E para o pós-operatório final, vocês veem que o, o equivalente esférico ele cai um pouquinho também em relação ao, ao intermediário, mas fica em mais ou menos menos 1,25. Né? E também havendo uma diferença estatística, porém, uh, é menor que 0,05, mas não tão forte como o de pré-operatório para uh, follow-up intermediário. E aqui mostrando que a, a média final uh, de equivalência esférica ficou em menos 1,1, com um, um erro padrão de mais ou menos 0,25 de optrias. Uh, e aqui um dado que o estudo dá é que o equivalente esférico ficou dentro de, de 0,5 de optrias da hemetropia, antes né, da cirurgia para 6% dos pacientes, e depois, no follow-up intermediário e no follow-up final, um terço dos pacientes. Então, nós temos o resultado final, ficou que um terço dos pacientes ficaram dentro de uh, meia dioptria da hemetropia. E o tratamento, ele objetivava a hemetropia, né? era, o, era o que se queria. Tanto que foram excluídos os tratamentos de abração parcial. 
Aqui, uh, mostrando astigmatismo refracional nesses três time points, nós temos que, uh, no pré-operatório, o astigmatismo refracional era uh, uma média de mais ou menos menos 4,5 de optrias. Um, melhorando para o follow-up intermediário, então, para aproximadamente menos 2, e caindo um pouquinho mais uh, no, no follow-up final. Houve diferença aqui entre todos os uh, time points avaliados, de, de pré-operatório para uh, follow-up intermediário, de, de uh, pré-operatório para follow-up final, e também de intermediário uh, para follow-up final. E aqui, o final, a média ficou de astigmatismo refracional menos 2,40, com, com erro padrão de mais ou menos 0,26 de optrins. Bom, aqui mostra a distribuição, então, do astigmatismo refracional, e uh, na, nas três, nos três time points também. O que eu quero chamar a atenção é que o astigmatismo refracional ele diminui e a gente consegue ver através de, dessas setas. Aqui em preto nós temos o pré-operatório, vocês veem que a maioria dos pacientes tinha um astigmatismo refracional superior a 3 dioptrias, e depois no, no follow-up final a maioria dos pacientes tinha um astigmatismo refracional inferior a 3. São essas três flechinhas. Essa tabela ela resume os gráficos que nós já comentamos antes, mas ela dá duas informações a mais também. Uh, o, o equivalente esférico, o astigmatismo refracional, eles melhoraram, como a gente tinha mostrado. A acuidade visual corrigida para a distância, além de não mudar muito os valores, também não houve diferença estatística. E a acuidade visual não corrigida para a distância melhora. E aqui os dois valores a mais que não tinham sido comentados antes. O astigmatismo seratométrico, ele tem uma melhora de média de 5,24 para aproximadamente 2,98. E o K central, e aqui a definição que eles dão de o K central como o valor médio de poder coniano para os anéis de diâmetros 2, 3 e 4 milímetros, também tem alguma melhora. Aqui um pouco sobre a parte de segurança, agora, uh, né, que foi estudada. Das complicações pós-operatórias, zero pacientes desenvolveram uh, reis clinicamente significativo, oito pacientes, então 14,8% desenvolveram regressão, uh, sendo que um desses oito, além, além da regressão, desenvolveu também ectasia e foi necessária a realização de outro transplante penetrante, nesse caso. Né? Uh, quatro pacientes, uh, 7% tiveram uh, falência do transplante e retratamento foi realizado em nove pacientes no total. Quatro deles, eles dizem por regressão, quatro por astigmatismo residual uh, e um por hipercorreção. De resultados também de complicação, uh, o artigo mostra uma tabela dizendo que tem sete pacientes que perderam duas ou mais linhas de acuidade visual corrigida para a distância após o, o PRK topoguiado, né? e aqui ele explica a causa de cada um. Um paciente, uh, então, foi aquele que teve a, a ectasia depois e precisou de outro transplante. Um paciente, eles não identificaram a causa específica, uh, diminuiu a, a acuidade visual corrigida para a distância de 20, 20 para 20, 30, e a, mas a acuidade visual uh, sem correção melhorou de 20, 200 para 20, 50. Quatro deles uh, foram por, então, a descompensação uh, né, corneana né, do, do transplante. E isso eles advogam que, eles imaginam que não tenha sido pela cirurgia, mas sim que uh, seria uma evolução uh, que aconteceu com os pacientes mas eles, a princípio, pelo que comentam, explicam que não teria relação. E o astigmatismo uh, de um paciente, depois de um ano, ele, tava, ele tinha melhorado para zero, na verdade, e depois regrediu para menos oito, foi a outra causa. Então, esses são sete pacientes que perderam duas ou mais linhas de acuidade visual corrigida. Conclusão, respondendo a nossa pergunta, né, uh, se, se pode o PRK topo guiado uh, Uh, oferecer refra... uh, a longo prazo correção refrativa de maneira segura em pacientes que realizam um transplante de córnea e têm astigmatismo residual, o que nós concluímos é que pode melhorar o equivalente esférico, uh, melhorar a... o astigmatismo refratométrico e seratométrico e melhorar a acuidade visual sem correção. No entanto, a acuidade visual com correção geralmente ela não, não chega na acuidade visual uh, com, com correção para distância. Né? E aqui eu gostaria de levantar alguns tópicos para nós discutirmos agora. Um é que é um estudo retrospectivo e que não tem um, um grupo de controle para comparação. 
tem a participação da indústria, como eu tinha enfatizado no início, né? isso é um, um fator para possível uh, um viés uh, de desfecho positivo. Né? Uh, esse é, o, até o momento, o maior estudo com o maior follow-up, e aqui eu coloco follow-up entre aspas, porque, na verdade, não é um estudo prospectivo, né? ele não acompanha os pacientes, por exemplo, de um ponto para frente, né? ele é retrospectivo, análise frontuária, mas, enfim, eles acompanharam os pacientes, né? eles têm vários dados de, de pós-operatório. Uh, então, é o, é o maior estudo com o maior follow-up até o momento de PRK topoguiado após transplante de córnea. E um dos resultados que eu gostaria de comentar é esse, que uh, objetivando a hemetropia, o equivalente esférico médio ficou em aproximadamente menos um, e em olhos sem doença nenhuma, não estou nem contando que esses são olhos, por exemplo, que fizeram transplante de córnea, mas olhos sem doença nenhuma, uh, se a gente tem um equivalente esférico de menos um, a acuidade visual sem correção à distância estimada é de aproximadamente 20 e 50. Então, a pergunta é como que nós deveríamos uh, abordar o paciente uh, de maneira pré-operatória, né, em função das expectativas também desse tipo de tratamento. A gente poderia dizer que a sua acuidade visual pode melhorar depois da cirurgia, mas provavelmente não vai ser a mesma uh, da sua acuidade visual corrigida com lente de contato, por exemplo. Uh, eu senti falta também, e os próprios autores comentam, de dados de aberração nesse caso. A gente, os desfechos são muito baseados em acuidade visual, a gente não tem outros dados uh, que também complementariam como é a visão, na verdade, de paciente, a berrometria, contraste. Né? No, na nossa visão não é composta apenas de, da acuidade visual, então são dados que, que nesse estudo faltaram. E agora também queria perguntar para vocês o que vocês acham, qual é o papel de outras intervenção cirúrgica, intervenções cirúrgicas nesses pacientes. Uh, por exemplo, tratamentos wavefront guiados, uh, ou seratotomia arqueada, após transplante penetrante, para corrigir o astigmatismo, e eventualmente depois para corrigir o remanescente esférico, um PRK, por exemplo. E é isso. Muito obrigado. Obrigado, Gabriel, pela... Excelente apresentação. Uh, inicialmente, eu queria perguntar para o Bidulho se ele tem algum comentário a terceiro aí sobre o artigo. Vocês estão me escutando aí? Ô, oh, Bidulho, bom dia. Onde você está, cara? Bom dia. Estou dirigindo, desculpa. É, primeiro, eu queria dar parabéns para o Gabriel. Foi uma excelente apresentação, bem direta. E, realmente, foi um estudo que nos interessou por ser um follow-up até relativamente longo, com um N razoável, pensando que a gente está lidando com pacientes pós-transplante, né, com esse astigmatismo grande e irregular que sobra o, do pós-transplante. E, e essa avaliação da, da cirurgia topo-guiada é, mostrou esse resultado então interessante no sentido de melhorar o equivalente esférico e, e conseguir melhorar principalmente a acuidade visual não corrigida, mas com relação à acuidade visual corrigida, não teve uma melhora significativa. É, pensando nisso, eu queria abrir aí, aproveitando esse slide da, da discussão que o Gabriel colocou, é, se existe, é, se vocês fariam outras opções, pensariam em outras opções de tratamento para esses pacientes que sobram um astigmatismo grande pós-transplante e são intolerantes à lente de contato rígida ou até escleral. É, o que, que a gente poderia propor e como que a gente abordaria esses pacientes? Parabéns, Gabriel. Obrigado. Legal. Bom, eu abro a pergunta aqui aos professores. Primeiro, o Dr. Mauro, vejo que está aqui conosco. Uh, não sei se... Dr. Edson também gostaria de comentar nesse, nesse sentido. E já deixo o um bom dia aqui também para o Vinícius, que já está aqui conosco. Muito obrigado, viu, Vinícius. Oi, Taguchi. Tudo bem? Opa, Brenner, tudo bem? Tudo Opa, ótimo. Tudo bom? Tá Posso fazer uns comentários aqui? Claro. Uh, eu não vi o início do, da discussão, desculpa. Uh, qual a plataforma que foi utilizada para esse tratamento? Uh, todos os é pacientes foram... Com o Schwind, foi o Sirius e depois o Amartes. Tá. Por que, que eles não colocaram o dado de aberrometria? Porque se o dado foi utilizado para o tratamento, é realmente ah, indefensável isso. Uhum. 
uh, deveria ter sido feita uma análise com base na biometria. Se eles ah. utilizaram os cílios, a, a informação eles têm pré e pós. Não faz sentido não ter análise de, de a biometria corneana, num tratamento guiado pela biometria corneana. Realmente não faz sentido nenhum. Uh, outra coisa que não faz muito sentido, quando a gente faz um tratamento guiado pela biometria corneana, um tratamento topo guiado, a gente visa principalmente melhora da qualidade visual corrigida. A, a não corrigida, ela acaba vindo junto. É óbvio que num tratamento topo guiado você tem uma menor precisão, a precisão é mais baixa, você tem que contar sempre com um desvio refracional nesse caso. Mas o objetivo principal do tratamento topo guiado é a melhora da qualidade visual com correção. Então estranho eles não terem notado a melhora da qualidade visual corrigida. Né, um pouco estranho ver, sabe, ver essa informação. Pós-transplante, eu não tenho experiência pós-transplante. Né? É, pós-transplante, a gente acaba tendo uma mescla de vários tipos diferentes de aberração e, às vezes, é muito difícil mesmo você, com muita aberração, você conseguir antever qual vai ser o seu desvio refrativo pós-operatório. Então, realmente, é, é mais desafiador. Ah... Uh... Vamos lá, uma coisa que eu não gosto de estudos, quando eles falam esse negócio de maior base de dados, maior estudo, eu, eu acho isso muito, sei lá, acho, eu não gosto. Sempre que eu reviso o paper, eu, eu vejo isso, eu, eu não gosto, eu nunca escrevo, eu acho um pouco prepotente, assim, eu não gosto disso. Então, esse tipo de discussão, é, é, para mim, não serve. Uh, você colocou aqui estudos retrospectivo, é, porque é difícil você fazer um prospectivo com, com casos uh, que são uh, raros, né? É muito difícil, você tem casos que você segue, na hora você vai dar uma olhada, você olha retrospectivamente seus resultados e acha que é um estudo, é um desenho uh, justificável. Grupo controle, qual seria o grupo controle no caso? Seria pacientes pós-transplante sem cirurgia, esse aí é, também não sei se o grupo controle qual que seria. Participação da indústria, é, os resultados não foram tão bons, né? então não sei se isso poderia ser justificado aqui. Com relação a que fazer nesses casos, né? primeiramente, todo tratamento que é topo guiado, você precisa avisar para o seu paciente que ele vai precisar mais de um. Muito dificilmente você consegue cravar com só um tratamento topo guiado. Você faz, você pode ter melhora da qualidade visual corrigida, mas você acaba tendo algum desvio refracional e esse cara vai precisar de um ajuste fino depois e você faz um, um ajuste fino, uma cirurgia convencional, digamos assim, se eu, a pessoa, se o paciente tiver adquirido uma, um ganho de, de visão corrigida. Um, eu lembro muitos anos atrás, eu fui num que era Toconos World Congress, e eles estavam discutindo o implante de anel pós-transplante. E engraçado que a conclusão que eles chegaram lá no, nesse, nesse encontro é que o, uma das melhores indicações Sim, de anel não. normal é para a correção de astigmatismo irregular pós-transplante. Não tenho experiência com isso, a, o pessoal aí tem mais experiência, mas é uma opção. E, oh, uh, good morning, Dr. Krieger. We are, uh, it's very nice uh, to have you here with us. Uh, we're uh, finishing our paper discussion uh, and then we'll, uh, pass, uh, we'll move on uh, for your uh, lecture, okay? Uh, so, I'm sorry, Brenner, uh, you, you may continue if you want uh, and in Portuguese, if you wish as well. <laughs> Não, era... Hello? Era basicamente isso mesmo. Uh... O pessoal okay. talvez tenha mais experiência com anel do que, do que eu, mas é sempre uma opção anel para esses casos. Mas a incisão arqueada, de jeito nenhum, e um novo tratamento é sempre bem-vindo para ajuste fino, basicamente isso. Então, obrigado pela, pela, pela palavra. Imagina, eu, eu que agradeço. Bom, então vamos mudar aqui o idioma, pessoal. Muito obrigado novamente, Gabriel. Uh, good morning. Everyone, uh, we'll move on now for our international meeting. So we'll just adjust our language <laughs> to English. Okay, and I'm sorry for those who have been watching us for the past few minutes. And we were discussing in Portuguese, uh, the paper that has been presented by our fellow. Uh, so now 
I would like, first of all, uh, thank for this uh, great opportunity to hear from uh, our colleagues in USA and our special guest, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Ronald Kruger. And this partnership with uh, Nebraska Medical Center has been, uh, it's been uh, great uh, for us. Um, and I hope we can continue uh, these meetings. And in a short uh, time, maybe we can uh, meet in, in person as well. But uh, Ronald, uh, Dr. Ronald Kruger is an internationally recognized leadership and has great experience in refractive surgery with an academic career of more than 25 years. He's been a previous director of the Department of Refractive Surgery at Cleveland Clinic and now chair of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at uh, UNMC and also previous president of the International Society of Refractive Surgery. And he'll present us with a lecture about topo-guided treatments. Again, I thank you very, very much for your uh, availability and your willingness to share uh, your knowledge with us. And I think Vinicius would like also to say some words. So please Vinicius and then uh, Dr. Ron Kruger, please feel free to start your lecture uh, soon afterwards. Yep. Uh well, you pretty much did a great introduction, Felipe. I think uh, heads up to you as well. I know you've been organizing those meetings uh, diligently over the past few months or years. And uh, it's, uh, I think we all benefit from this partnership. It's uh, again, for me, now speaking English, of course, but it's, it's great for me to log in and, and, and hear some discussion in Portuguese as well, because <laughs> sometimes you forget. Uh, even some terms, it's kind of interesting. Uh, well, uh, thanks everybody for logging in, both here in the Omaha, Nebraska, and also in Sao Paulo and Brazil and, and Norway. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, Dr. Kruger, you may start. Um, uh, Felipe did a, me a great introduction. And uh, as he said, he's the chair of our department here now. It's, uh, it's been a great uh, time with him here. He's been expanding the service quite, quite a lot. And uh, this, this, this department is going to uh, be one of the major hubs of ophthalmology in, the, in this area of the United States uh, very, very, very soon. So we hope to, as Felipe said, to maybe at some point when everything is done with this COVID thing, we can maybe uh, do like in-person meetings, share like knowledge in person. I think that would be a great experience for, for, for both our universities. So Dr. Kruger, if you may. Yes, thank you, uh, Vinicius. Thank you, Felipe, for the introductions. Uh, thanks for making this uh, uh, available for all of us to share some information. And uh, Vinicius told me, he says, you know, the Brazilians are all interested. They want to hear more about topo guided, you know, ablations. And I said, well, I talk about that a lot, but sure, I'll, I'll give you some of the latest uh, information that I have. And I know we've talked about it before. Uh, I'd like my lecture to be a little bit more of, of a discussion if possible, because as I go through some of this, I'll go through it a little slower and then make sure people have questions and just throw in, I'll, I'll throw in some examples at the end, which I think uh, will be practical as well. All right, thank you. Uh, I, I love your uh, graphics. You know, this was sort of the advertisement that was uh, placed about topo guided treatments, update on strategies. And I think a strategies is a little bit of the key of this. I mean, a lot of us are now understanding and we have um, a good sense that this is a, this is a good treatment. This is really giving us some more accuracy in what we're treating overall. There's still some skepticism in the field that they say way for an optimize is just as good. Why are you bothering with all these extra steps? But you know, I'm just a purist to try to do the best for my patients. And this, I feel we're pushing the envelope into better and better treatments. Uh, again, through the introductions, I was formerly at the Cleveland Clinic for 20 years as uh, director of refractive surgery, had many Brazilian fellows there, uh, now at the University of Nebraska and the Trollson Eye Institute, and hope to be able to keep the connections with Brazil good and strong going forward. I am a uh, consultant with Alcon. It gives me uh, a lot of uh, access to the information that Alcon is doing and, and stays on the cutting edge of things. Um, this is a, a recent paper that was just published back in November uh, of physicians that had surgery comparing the outcomes of wafer optimized with topography guided in uh, a whole group of um, 
I, it was about 300 um, physician eyes that were treated over a period of time. And I didn't want to really get into that. That was a previous talk that I'd given about it. But the, the salient feature from that was just to show that um, everything was the same between Wavefront Optimized and Contura. Um, 2020 rates were essentially the same. Satisfaction questionnaire was the same. Um, you know, except for the really good visions of 2010 and 2015. And by offering the Contour, we were able to see, you know, higher percentages of 2015 and 2020 vision or 2010 vision uh, postoperatively. And that was sort of the driver that sort of made us believe, okay, we're doing something here that's really giving exquisite vision by treating some of these aberrations. Uh, this is a little bit of the paper that just came out in uh, November. And again, it was, it was 450 eyes, um, 300 wavefront optimized, uh, 100 topography guided. And you can see a little bit of the, the stats just showing the, the statistical uh, uh, benefit. Uh, about 98.3% overall satisfaction with laser vision correction and all, which is quite good numbers. So um, just looking at what is driving some of this difference that, that uh, is helping us to get this more exquisite vision. You know, it's really, if you look at this example of an optimized ablation on the left versus a uh, uh, topography guided one here on the right, they really, really look very similar. Um, and you can sort of see the shapes a little bit different because of the aberrations. We're correcting small things. Do those small things really matter much? Um, it's, it's a little bit on that shape difference, but it's also the centration. The centration with Optimize is always based on the pupil center. And when we're doing a contour, we're treating on the corneal vertex or the corneal apex. And that's a shift of the overall ablation pattern that's being placed. And so some of those subtle irregularities in a cylinder that we're treating shifted over a little bit to where the apex is is part of the driver that's just giving us a little bit better visions overall. My very first case, I like to show this one, you know, I was sort of gutsy, this was going back uh, 2016 or thereabouts, you know, minus eight CEO of a company, you know, uh, wanted to have a good vision. And I thought, well, here's this great product, Contura, everything sort of matched up nicely. You can see the cylinder uh, here in this eye and, and that matched up with the refraction overall. And we, we formed these composite maps to show there was good agreement. The difference maps didn't show any big irregularity. So there was qualification in, in treating that patient. And then overall, here you can see, you know, we looked at pupil size and all that. One week post-op, he's 2015 plus, and he continued on uh, that way at three months and beyond. And the nice thing about it is you look at the pre-op and you look at the post-op and you can see yeah, there is some aberrations here on this refractive map, you know, more steepness down below. Here, this very uniform looking green zone. And you can see the difference where we selectively treated in the difference map, uh, more down below, a little bit more in the center relative to the surrounding areas. And these were all the small irregularities that we were able to pick up and treat and helped us to get a very uniform outcome overall. But the real question with this, you know, those are the easy ones. You know, you just say, okay, we're gonna treat the aberrations. Um, let's go ahead and use Contura. The cylinder uh, manifest matches with the measured um, astigmatism from the topography and everything is great. However, it doesn't always work that way. You know, what, if you, what should you do if your manifest refraction is significantly different in terms of the magnitude of astigmatism, like in this particular case, on the upper part or in the um, angle of astigmatism where you see a big difference and you're like saying, okay, is there coma factoring in? Is it internal astigmatism? What's going on? And how do I come up with the right treatment plan? Uh, this was a case of a patient who uh, I did cataract surgery on uh, with a symphony lens and wanted to get this patient, you know, right on target with this uh, lens, but there was some residual astigmatism there even though the topography showed uh, that there was very little um, overall astigmatism, there still was some refractive astigmatism post-op. And so I looked and said, well, you know, there's some irregularities in this patient. Uh, we, we probably should go ahead and 
try to do a small touch up to get the vision better because she was about 20, 30 minus and just not completely happy. And so here's just a case in point where the refraction showed more cylinder. Uh, but when you looked at the overall pattern uh, on the map and what it defined, the measured astigmatism value was only about 0.4. And so we ended up um, going ahead and just doing TMR, which is treating what the maps say. And in this case, the maps plus the aberrations uh, corrected this patient with a very good post-operative outcome. Uh, part of the magic that helped me to understand, okay, do I treat on the refraction, put in more cylinder? Do I treat on the maps, you know, in, or in, in terms of topographic astigmatism? I was able to do a wavefront and then compare the wavefront shape to the ablation pattern if I was going to treat the TMR or the, the actual topographic cylinder. And I could see this matched up very nicely with the kind of shape of the residual myopia. And so that confirmation just allowed me to go forward and get a good outcome overall. But treating topography, you know, and getting all the cylinder on the front surface is not the entire answer. And this is a great example of a patient that was treated by a colleague where three months after surgery, the patient had a near perfect outcome because you look and say, the Pentacam shows there's no residual astigmatism left. We've treated everything, we've got it all. And yet the patient was a little bit blurry and unhappy because there still was posterior astigmatism on the back surface of the I had this other really good example case back when I was at Cleveland Clinic uh, of a patient who came to me, um, one of three sisters, uh, came from New York City, said, I, hey, I, my sister had LASIK with you. I'd like to have it too. I, I, I need to fly back soon. You know, can you do my surgery? 22 years old. And you can see her refraction. She's 20, 25, uncorrected, but she's got three quarters of a diopter against the rule of stigmatism that corrects her to 2015 minus. And if you look at this overall pattern, it looks a lot like with the rule of stigmatism. And I'm thinking, okay, I can fix you maybe with this new Contura, but do I treat what the refraction says, especially with the aberrations of the Contour? Should I just do wafer and optimize and, and correct her? Or can I really do something by correcting these aberrations and give her a good outcome? And which axis do I treat, the against the rule or the with the rule sort of astigmatism? So we looked at it. I looked at a lot of details. The topo maps shed 71 degrees. Pentacam maps, you know, suggested uh, 55. Uh, the manifest cylinder was about four degrees in terms of the, the minus cylinder. You know, so there was a lot of variability overall to the shape. And so finally, again, I used the wavefront to capture and say, what do the optics say objectively? That wavefront matched up with an ablation pattern that went along with treating the refractive astigmatism rather than the topographic astigmatism. And uh, we went ahead and treated this patient with a good outcome. Here you can see what we actually did by treating the refractive astigmatism is we created um, further astigmatism on her cornea. You know, she had um, this difference map shows, but you can see there's more astigmatism in this lower map uh, showing that we, we generated more, but it was matching a level of internal astigmatism that the patient had. And she ended up having 2010 vision, better than her best corrected vision pre-op. And that continued on even a year later, she came back and I was able to show that she had, uh, again, 2010 vision with a good outcome, still showing a little bit of that corneal astigmatism, which had to kind of, from a coupling perspective, had to neutralize internal astigmatism. So that kind of brings us to say, well, how can we go forward? You know, what's, what are some of the planning methods to figure this out? Because it's a little bit hard and it takes a lot of brain power, and, you know, and, and people want a formula. They say, I, I want to do this contura, but I want and I need a formula because just looking at all these things and trying to piece it together seems a little too random to me. And um, uh, Mark Lobanoff, who works a lot with this platform and is consulting with Alcon, came up with this geometric mathematical formula or solution called Forcities. And it basically said that the manifest refraction equals the anterior stigmatism 
the talus based stigmatism, which has to do with the aberrations, the posterior stigmatism, and a level of lens or internal astigmatism. So all of these things contribute to what our manifest refraction is. So if we have the manifest refraction, we have um, all of these different components, except maybe the, the internal, we can ultimately determine what's the best ablation profile that factors all these things uh, into consideration. So that comes up with this concept of a talus. You know, what is a talus? And a talus in terms of geometric maps is to say that when you have a contour that shows a peak area, and then there's a slightly different slope from all the other slopes that you see, like in the case you see this peak and then there's this kind of sand area down below, that's sort of the talus that's being described at least in terms of uh, landscape. And these are the taluses that say, well, we have our overall shape of the cornea, and yeah, we have astigmatism, and we have this level of myopia that we have to treat, but then there's these subtle little areas of raised taluses that we also want to factor in because they can influence the overall uh, refraction and astigmatism we need to treat. So each hemimeridian of a talus contributes to the overall astigmatism. And the thing that we see here, the most the, the greatest magnitude uh, of the taluses here is this number three um, that we can see. And, but it's also the furthest from the center. So we weight the magnitude of how intense the talus is, but we also wanna factor that in with the distance. So the fact that it's further from the center, it's gonna have less influence overall to the refraction. It's gonna influence it differently based on the distance. But taluses that are much closer to the center are going to have much greater impact, even if they're of slightly lower value. So you really want to factor all of them in with this geogra geographic mapping. This is just a great example of how powerful taluses are. And you can sort of say, well, here it shows this talus of a fairly high magnitude that's really close to the center of this patient that has uh, astigmatism. Again, the astigmatism is more against the rule, as you can see by this, this white line, that's kind of the steep axis here, it's expressed in minus cylinder. Um, and yet the measured astigmatism says that it's about 90 degrees away uh, or 80 degrees away from what the refraction saying. So there's a difference of 2.75 diopters between that's measured on the front surface of the eye versus the clinical refraction. And again, how do we treat this? You know what is really happening and this talus is creating coma and that coma is generating uh, a level of astigmatism. So Dr. Lobanoff came up with this four cities uh, concept where you're plugging in your manifest refraction, you're putting in your uh, contour measurements in terms of what the topolizer vario is giving you. You've got your topographer from a pentacam that has front and back surface astigmatism and then the overall aberration talus value give, given based on the maximum versus the center values that factor in all those small hemi meridians that are being measured in talus. And, and that's when you plug it in, coming up with a, a nice cookbook way of, of coming up with a, a ablation plan. So Carl Snowcipher is a good friend of mine and uh, his face is in that lower corner. He's very nicely uh, published this paper together with Mark Lobanoff on comparing some of the outcomes with Contura using the different planning strategies. And again, just for clarification, TCAT was the original study of Contura that was done in the US that based everything off the manifest refraction. We treated the aberrations, but we planned it based on the axis and magnitude of the astigmatism in the refraction. Um, TMR, uh, came about a little bit later, which is, well, we really don't want to use the refraction because this information from the, from the taluses and the aberrations is changing the astigmatism. We really want to treat off the maps. And then there was modified TMR versus TMR. And, and so it was always like, do we do the TCAT, which is a manifest refraction, or do we do um, the TMR, which is the topography, or some semblance between? Well, four cities came up to sort of say, We've got a way of calculating this to know which way we go based on all this geometric optics, I think, which is a good idea. And, and this slide very nicely shows 
that in his specific data, just his data alone in this paper that's been published, you know, you can see that overall 2020 values were the same between the TCAT and the four cities, but where you saw the difference again was the 2015 values where things were just higher with the four cities planning because you could get a little bit more accuracy. If you looked at all four sites that were in this study, which was uh, a total of a whole lot more eyes, uh, they pretty much were matched between them. Um, overall, about 600 eyes in the study uh, equally distributed between these groups. Um, you can kind of get a sense that here 2020s were the same, but once again, 2015 values for all the centers were showing greater percentages with four cities compared to the, the TCAT method, which is the way was, was the FDA study was done. Um, that was, there's other further papers that even compare it with TMR to suggest that, um, that this is not, uh, that four cities is ultimately giving the best results. And so I kind of want to round out this talk a little bit by just throwing these examples out because some might say, well, when you're planning this, how do you know that your talus is right and that all the information is correct? And these are just cases I just did yesterday. So they were fresh, fresh off, hot off the press in my planning. I don't have the post-op values to say, yeah, look at this great result, but it's just to kind of show the planning that I'm doing. So here's a 32 year old white female, low myopia. You, you can see the refraction is a minus one and a half plus a quarter a 27. Again, 27 degrees, she's 2015. The maps are showing that she has with the rule of stigmatism, a higher value of with the rule of stigmatism. Am I gonna treat off these maps? Or am I gonna treat a little bit off the manifest refraction, which is saying a completely different magnitude and axis. And again, this is a low myo, you know, this patient 2040, I wanna get her 2015 or better. So here you can see the Pentacam is showing 1.5886. You look at the back surface is about 0.4 at 85. So that matches up. You might say, well, there's at least 1.1 diopters of astigmatism that's with the rule. Otherwise, very good looking candidate. So this is my um, worksheet that I use for planning. You know, I'll put in what is the manifest refraction, the cycloplegic refraction, the Pentacam Ks, and the, the astigmatism values, and also the topolizer vario case, you know, to kind of look at that levels of astigmatism, thinnest cornea, all that. And then I'm putting down, this would be normally what we would plan just based on the refraction. And then I put in my values for what four cities tells me underneath it. And it tells me how much would it have differed from my overall manifest refraction. You can see this one differs quite a bit in the fact that the axis is very different. Here's a quarter adopter or 0.38, so not a big amount on the magnitude, but the axis is quite different because some of that had to do with what the topography was showing. Um, and at least look, looking at this right eye more specifically. So how do we do this planning? You know, we're, we're putting in all the numbers. We've, we've populated um, the information from the Pentacam, from the Vario, from the refraction, and then looking at the taluses and all, here it is suggesting on the very first rendition of this, uh, as we plug it in and it just populates it off the taluses, that we're gonna treat about 0.3 diopters at 171 degrees. And you can see a lot of internal astigmatism to sort of compensate for the fact that there is a difference between the topography and the, and the manifest refraction. Now here is my talus map that I'm looking at. Three different taluses are coming out. One and, one and three are kind of off on the periphery and two is a pretty large one and it's close to the center. So I know it's gonna be influencing things a little bit and I should definitely weight that. Now, this is the way it populated as we did it automatically, but I don't fully like the way it looks because it's picking out this spot that's a little bit closer than what the real high magnitudes of this talus are. Uh, and it's picking the center area. And I feel like I wanna drill this down a little bit better. So again, 0.3 at 171. Here's another one where I just drew out and broke it out a little bit more into four different taluses. And this represents it a whole lot better. 
0.38 at 167. So it changed a little bit. You can see my talus moved. It changed a little bit of what it factored the internal astigmatism to be, and it changed the overall final treatment vector here in black, which follows the same axis of the astigmatism that topography says, different than the manifest, but at a much lesser value in order to not overcorrect because of what it's measuring internally. Now there's one more talus that we drew out, and that's to say, what if we just drew all this convoluted and, and put one single value to it? Look at where this talus is. It's giving some, some value. It's off in the middle of a flat area uh, or a, a, a non-elevated area on the cornea where the taluses aren't. And of course, it says the same axis, 171, a little higher value, but this is not the one I would wanna choose, you know, in this example overall. So here's example number two, 34 year old white male, myopic astigmatism. Um, here you can see uh, minus two and a half, plus two and a quarter at 140 degrees, 2020 plus, kind of follows what the maps are saying. Um, here overall, two diopter cylinder at 129, um, kind of gives you a, a good sense that this is maybe something that would work out uh, with the treatment. Here's the topolizer uh, barrio information, and I populated that as well. And if you look at this, you know, this is really treating astigmatism. This is a patient that's got a lot of astigmatism. We want to get this axis right. Manifest refraction says 140 degrees. Penicam saying 129 degrees. The vario says 134. I guess we're treating off the vario. We could treat right TMR and be somewhere in between and be pretty close, but the magnitudes are slightly different. You know, what do we ultimately treat? So again, looking here at this overall planning uh, software, um, we can see what I ultimately plugged in, but I looked at all those values to get the, the right overall uh, correction. Now, let's see. Okay. Uh, it looks like I lost the slide on some of this. Uh, anyway, I, I ultimately looked at it and, and was able to determine that there was taluses that were not fully recognized that I had to compensate for. And uh, in, in doing that, I was able to get the... The, the correction to treat this two diopters of cylinder. And then there was a, a note that said, hey, we really should recheck the refraction. Turns out we rechecked the refraction. It was a quarter diopter less myopic cylinder. Um, we reduced that, recalculated overall and came up with a number. So all these numbers are close. Your refraction has to be very accurate because otherwise all these small details of what you're doing are gonna not really work well and, uh, and, and you're not gonna you know, really get the value of all this extra planning that's being uh, enhanced. But I think the bottom line is to say, it's here. Um, a lot of people are adopting this and more and more people in the US and around the world are, are pursuing uh, Contura. Uh, Four Cities is a great planning mechanism to sort of help us go further with that. Uh, you gotta get really, you know, good data in, we'll get good data and outcomes out. Um, and, and I would say it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to pursue, but spend the time, understand the four cities, and you can get these exquisite results that we're beginning to show more 2015s and more 2010s. Okay. So thanks for your attention. Let me stop share here a minute. Okay, any questions? You know, I, I've taken about a half an hour overall um, I wanted to kind of just throw it out. I think some of the examples that I showed about how even the taluses you have to drill down and make sure they're adequately represented. Um, give me some feedback of your thoughts. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ron. Uh, I believe uh, Dr. Shamon uh, asked the question in the chat. I apologize uh, because he's uh, with our medical students. I don't know if he can- I may try. Oh. Okay. I may try. Hi. Uh, I'm at the o Hi, Ron. I uh, apologize. I'm at the OR with the medical students today. So it's quite noisy here and uh, I have a very good connection. Uh, great, great cases. Great lecture as always. Uh, we, we thank you very much for being able to be with us. My question is, I realize that more, in many of your cases, you're, you're worried about the influence of the posterior astigmatism that is not detected by the controller. So you want to know the true 
corneal astigmatism of the patient. And you're using different methods for that. Uh, when calculating IOLs, I like very much to use the ATR from Pentacam, which uses anterior and posterior uh, surfaces of the cornea to calculate corneal power. And you can determine the diameter that you want to consider. And I always use the pupil diameter for that. And it gives you the signature. So it, it could be a good idea to, to use it to check if you have any posterior astigmatism that may influence on your results. Have you ever thought about using it? About, about looking at posterior astigmatism when planning, you're, you're saying with IOLs? I don't know if I followed your question entirely. Right. Uh, no, I'm you're... sorry, I'm sorry. No, using the Pentacam AQR to determine the true corneal astigmatism. Instead of looking at the anterior and the posterior, the, the true K with the AQR will uh, give you uh, the total astigmatism. Uh, you know, if, if the sound isn't good, Tagushi may, may say it again for you because I'm here with a mask and uh, it doesn't no, no, sound no. I, I, I think I, you're, you're sort of saying, looking at that, that the true astigmatism value that factors it in, Pentacam, Galilei does that um, for planning software. And it doesn't always match exactly if you subtract, say, the posterior from the anterior astigmatism. You know, the, the, the true cylinder or total cylinder is not always the same value. And so you look at that calculation and say, maybe that's giving some value overall. Um, it's, I, I would imagine that's something that could be populated into four cities you know, instead of saying we're putting anterior and posterior, we'll just put in the, the true K so. Um, but no one's done that yet. I, I think, there, I think there, there could be some value to it. Great. Um, any other questions? Uh, I, I would, uh, our next uh, session is uh, with our fellow Vinicius and he'll present uh, some cases. I think we can uh, discuss as well if, uh, are you okay with it, uh, Professor Kruger? Yes, please. You know, right. Go on to the cases. Um, you know, this was sort of, I, I knew there was going to be cases. I figured this is sort of a good intro to four cities if they're, uh, if, and to contour, if they're going to be contour related cases. Yeah, it, it was perfect. We wish we had this lecture before <laughs> and the cases we we're about to present. Uh, so, right. uh, Vinicius, uh, please, if you can share your screen. Sure, sure. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Tagushi, and thank you, Dr. Ronald, for this beautiful lecture. I'm Vinicius Sekin. I'm a fellow here at UNIFESP, and I'm going to present. The first case is from a 32-year-old male, a philosophy teacher. Uh, he was a soft contact, contact lenses where for 60 years, six years and stopped it three years ago due to intolerance. And he had the pharitis in both eyes. His uncorrected visual acuity was 20 over 40 and 20, 30 partial. His current spectacles were these ones. His manifest refraction was these ones. And cycloplegic refraction was more or less the same. After three months of high eyelid hygiene, lubricant, and oxycycline, his interior profile of the cornea was this. The pachymetry maps were these ones. Vinicius, may I uh, stop you for a second? Uh, would sure, sure. like to ask a question for Dr. Krieger. Uh, first of all, I apologize for all our negative cylinders, <laughs> but it's uh, great to exercise our, our <laughs> transposition uh, skills. So, uh, the first question I would ask Dr. Krieger is how long, if uh, the patient has an ocular surface disease, uh, do you treat these cases in order to achieve an optimal topography or um, any other kind of measurement for a guided treatment? Yeah, I'm looking at what you've uh, placed there here. After three months, you know, lid hygiene, lubricants, doxycycline, are they uh, broken up? Are they choppy? Um, 
And that'll tell you if your ocular surface is least giving a very smooth contour. Um, I think three months is, is a pretty good time overall for treating um, dry eyes and ocular surface problems. But again, you know, poor information in, you get poor information out. Um, and that's where you have to just make sure everything is optimized, especially when you're doing something like Contura, which is so sensitive on all those small details. So I'd say overall, you know, I think three months of treatment is reasonable. So for this patient, we opted to do a guided treatment. This is the topolizer map. These are the several measurements that we've made. Uh, trying to achieve a repeatable uh, result. Here we have the imputation and uh, the laser and the resulting examination profile. And this is the ablation profile proposed by the laser. Here, uh, here we we'll do adjust uh, this this profile because it has a measurement difference between the, the manifest and uh, the measured astigmatism. Yeah, that's my question too. Is you have your measured and your manifest? Uh, what what are you using to plug in as the actual cylinder of treatment? Uh, the previous slide, uh, Nisus. So in, slow. <laughs> the lower, in the lower left-hand corner, you have treatment details, you know, and you have measured, modified, you know, the axis looks pretty, pretty good, five or six degrees, but the magnitude's a little bit different. You know, the measured says 2.66, you know, the modified is two, that's based on the refraction. Why not treat 2.66? Why are you treating off the refraction? You know, how are you deciding whether to do true TMR or to do uh, TCAT, which is the manifest? That was our question because uh, these were one of our initial cases soon after the uh, laser software was updated. And we hadn't been um, experimenting with uh, Contura before that. And this was, I believe, the first case. And we kept the manifest refraction uh, because just we were used to it. Uh, so. But uh, that's, that's why I asked, um, I, I believe uh, now your uh, professor has uh, commented that uh, you're using four CDs, but we don't have uh, access to it yet. Um, so uh, how, how would you adjust this treatment if, if you would? Uh, would you treat uh, the, the measured, uh, the TMR right off the bat? So I, I would say that before having four cities, which I'd like to plug in and, and use the benefit of looking at all the, the, the geometric differences inside the eye, um, I probably would have done what you did. I probably would say, okay, you know, the, the TMR says treat 2.66 diopters. That's a little strong with the amount of astigmatism. There's probably some, you know, internal astigmatism as well that maybe, you know, you're not seeing on just the front surface with the TMR. Uh, and you've got the manifests, you know, sometimes you say treat a little less is always a little safer, that you don't flip axis. If you leave a little residual axis, a little a residual astigmatism, same axis, a lot more tolerable for the patient than if you flip their axis because you treat it too much. So I probably would have done what you're doing so far and, and, and put in the manifest um, to go along with my topography map. So this is the ablation profile proposed by the laser. And this is uh, the report uh, from the right eye, the, the, the fellow eye, the who fellow. was not topo guided, the brief from to optimize it, who was an eventful. And here we have the contura, which was also an eventful. This is our three months post-op interior profile of the cornea of both eyes. And now the, the uncorrected visual acuity was 20 over 15. 
for the right eye, who was with front guided, and the uncorrected visual acuity uh, for the topo guided one was 20 over 25. And now both eyes side by side. Can you go back a moment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's interesting when you look at your post-operative information, um, that was the, yeah, this is the, the topo guided one. Uh, you've got 0.6 diopters of residual astigmatism post-operatively, which was that extra 0.6 that you didn't treat. If you treated TMR, you would have probably got them close to zero in terms of the astigmatism on the front surface. But However, uh, this is, uh, the, the axis is inverted. Oh, it, looks, it looks like another residual. So you actually flipped Over. his axis. Yep. Again, so, so in this case, it was a good idea to treat the, <laughs> the manifest and not the topo because you would have flipped it even more. Okay. Uh, we, we have observed some minor uh, hypercorrections in, in, in some of these cases. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, do you have any uh, ideas or explanations for that, uh, Dr. Krieger? For the for the flipping of the axis, or overall, we are experiencing some uh, hypercorrections on using contour uh, or or TCAT. Um, yeah, we can. You know, I I don't know if I have a a, a set explanation. Um, I would, I would anticipate that more if you said you were getting overcorrections with TMR, because TMR sometimes will give you a, a, what, what is perceived to be a high value for astigmatism to treat. And, and it's not really considering the back surface of the cornea or internal astigmatism. And that's why Forcities really helps to, to bring that into a more realistic treatment profile. Um, I, I would I would think it would be interesting to see what Forcities would have said in this case. My guess is it would have been pretty close to that manifest refraction, and uh, plugging that in and treating it again, you you ended up getting a little residual astigmatism that was flipped. I can't I don't know if I really can explain why that might be the case. Uh, as I said before, this was uh, one of our first uh, cases. That's why one eye has been treated with uh, wavefront optimized and the other eye with uh, uh, contra. And well, but we brought it this case because uh, in the end, it was a um, eye matched a comparison uh, between those the, the two ab ablation profiles. Right, and I guess your point is that the. The TMR or the topo guided treatment had a 2025 outcome, but the wavefront optimized treatment had a 2015 outcome, right? Uh, that's the that's what happened in this case. But uh, I believe we don't have the the, the maybe the, the we, we need to adjust our our uh, treatment uh, in order to. Uh, get better results, uh, and and that's why I said maybe if we had the, uh, watched your lecture before, maybe this patient would have been a different uh, result. Do you guys do you guys have the like? Do you still have like any wavefront like analysis that you can do? Like I remember we had the eye design there when I was a fellow there. Like do you still have that in there? Yeah, we have the eye design and this has been performed for this patient, uh, but we don't have this in this uh, particular presentation. Okay. okay, no, 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 good. But Because I think it's some, like what Dr. Kruger always says, like I think the more information preoperative you have, kind of like the better planning you can do. So if, I think like if you're planning for Contura, like again, the, the, the more information you can gather, I think will, will, will help you understand what's going on a little bit better. And then you can maybe achieve that like 2015 they were looking for? The, the thing I did a lot when I was at Cleveland Clinic before Forcities was around um, is I had an old LADAR wave, which was the Alcon product from a previous generation back when the LADAR vision laser was around. 
And that was for wafering guided treatments, but I used that diagnostically all the time. And I loved it because it would, it would show me um, kind of where the ablation, where, where the uh, residual myopia and astigmatism was, it would give me some details of what you measured optically with the whole eye. And I would always use that as a comparison was, does this make sense with the overall pattern and magnitude to what the ablation profile is saying? Because the amount of laser you're treating in a myopic case should match the overall pattern, kind of like that one I showed in my presentation that helped me to, to decide which axis I would treat when there was big differences in axis. Um, I no longer have that device. I'm in the market for finding a better wavefront device that I could use. I will um, make a statement that, you know, I'm looking at getting the eye design uh, just, just for diagnostic purposes. Uh, but uh, Dan Neal, who was the designer of the eye design, you know, he, he started wavefront sciences that J and J bought out, you know, AMO bought out and then J and J inherited. Um, he's making a whole new wavefront device that sounds like it's gonna be even more robust than the eye design. So I'm looking at that and hoping to get an early one, you know, at our center so I could test it out for, with, test it out for him. Uh, but I, I really need something like that to give me more diagnostic information for some of these cases. In other words, good. Um, when I get the device, if it's working well, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay, it would be a great pleasure to hear from uh, from you again, uh, Professor. Uh, so, uh, Vinicius, please. Uh. Sure. Uh, this next, next case is from a 22-year-old female. She's a nurse. Uh, she has never used contact lenses. She has uncorrected visual acuity of 2400 in both eyes. Her current spectacles are these ones. Her manifest refraction is more or less congruent. And the psychoplegia was 20 over 20 with more or less the same refraction as well. These are the anterior profile of the cornea. And for the treatment from the right eye, we did the same approach. Uh, we, we performed several examinations with the topolizer. We put in the laser. Uh, this is the resulting examination profile. We targeted the refraction. Um, Vinicius, uh, I have a question for Dr. Kruger again. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to draw uh, attention to a point because uh, is more, uh, more is not always better because uh, here the surgeon uh, didn't pre-select the, you can go back one more slide, please, uh, Mrs. And the surgeon did not select previously the, the maps to be uh, the, the input for the laser. Um, so you can see there's, there are some slightly different maps uh, right there. Would you exclude uh, any of them or make any alterations to this profile before going on with the, tree, with the planning? Um, I, I, I don't think I would put in all of those maps, that's, there, you don't need that many, obviously. You know, you just need maybe four or, or maybe six or something if you wanted to plug it in, you have quite a few there. And that might be one way of just trying to be more discriminating because the differences you're seeing is noise. You know, that's the only way to explain it. And if you can filter out noise as much as possible, you'll, get more accurate true signal in your treatment. The ablation profile proposed by the laser. And for this patient, we actually perform a trans PRK, a guided trans PRK. So we ablated the aptilion 15 micron, and then the refractive ablation, which was an eventful. In the first month post-operative, the patient had uncorrected visual acuity of 20 over 40. She complained a lot about blurriness and waviness of straight lines. And we actually waited a little bit 
for the healing to mature. And with six months post-operative, she was 2020 and accepted a little bit of refraction to stay at 2020 sharp. Come, uh, go, go back treatment. one place, Vinicius. Okay. And, uh, here we, obviously this is not a, a LASIK uh, treatment, but uh, that's uh, the, the main question. Does the topo guided treatment work when you remove the mm -hmm. epilion? And in this particular case, we observed that the, the astigmatism uh, wasn't really changed by the treatment, despite of the, the, the ablation profile that can be seen in the differential map. Uh, so how do you address these, these points, Dr. Kruger? So yeah, you, you've gotten an outcome that's harder to explain as to what really happened because you put in the, the appropriate amount of astigmatism correction, you know, your ablation profile looked like it, it corresponded to it. And yet you've got almost like a, a little bit of a central island sort of appearance of steepness in the center. Um, more maybe treated around the periphery and maybe it's not clear as to why that happened. Uh, my question would probably be, cause I'm, I'm less familiar with the uh, laser PTK because we don't have the software in the US yet, but you, you treated what 50 microns of laser PTK, trans yeah, 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 that's yeah. The treatment was performed with fifty microns. Yeah, it it might have been useful to have had a um, an OCT epithelial thickness map to see how regular the epithelium looked pre-op, and then when you're blading some of that, was there you know was there more um, uh, uh, epithelium left in the periphery or in, in the center before you started doing the topo guided and did maybe some of that had a factor in your outcome. Yeah, the, the, that's the difficulty we find when using uh, Alcon uh, laser because uh, it doesn't allow for uh, modifying the, the, the thickness along the, the periphery. Uh, that may be solved with their new uh, update uh, that's Streamlight. We have it here, but it doesn't allow uh, for guided treatments yet. I believe it's only performed in uh, way from optimized treatments. And Dr. Uh, Professor Mauro has raised his hand. Uh, please, mm -hmm. Professor. Hi, good morning. Hi, Ron. It's nice to see you looking even younger. Nice. I want to know what you are drinking because this is really great. Thank you for seeing you and your fellow. Uh, I completely agree with you in terms of uh, the effectiveness of uh, alcohol laser to remove the epithelium in a uniform way. We, we, are, we submitted data on doing simple PRK using mechanical versus Alcon uh, software for removal of the epithelium. And unfortunately, we, we saw much more central islands when you let the laser to remove the epithelium. Uh, so my thoughts in this case would be probably the epithelium behavior in a different way, or you, you left some uh, thin layers of the cells and, and did the refractive ablation over it. But my question to you is, is not exactly in this single case, but refers to the patients that achieved 2015 vision with the Contura methods or any of the other methods. Are you selecting uh, a, an ideal aspherecity for post-op? Do you believe that we can, dealing with it, uh, increase the number of patients that go up to 2015? So it's a good question. And in the early days of Contura, um, I actually played more with the asphericity. You know, I would look and say, okay, let's go ahead and leave this at a minus 0.3 or something along those lines 
to see if I, but I, I kind of moved away from that. A lot of my colleagues were not really paying much attention to it. And I thought there's, there's so many variables when you're doing this that maybe I shouldn't uh, try to, you know, push the envelope by leaving something that I don't know is really the best thing or not. So if you, if you play with the asphericity, will it, will it deliver? Yeah, maybe. But I think more than anything, it's you want to master it well with keeping the asphericity about the same as the pre-op. And, and then you can begin to sort of look and say, okay, well, now that I'm getting great results with this, let me start modifying small amounts of the asphericity to see if I can even make it better. Uh, Ron, uh, we are almost 20 years later on doing these customized ablations. And still the big problem is when you do this, uh, let's say virgin corneas, the results are as great as you show it in your lecture. But when we try to use these uh, concepts on more complicated cases, such as uh, post-keratoplasty astigmatism, such as the paper we discussed early this morning, the results are almost disappointing. Would you tell us your explanations for this? So we, we were not able to, uh, you know, make, uh, make our results better, even though we are 20 years away in this, in this road to excellence? Yeah, so the, the, the reason why I thought Wavefront Guided was such a big deal when it first came out 20 years ago uh, was there was the hope that by treating something that just wasn't spherocylindrical optics, that you're treating some irregularities with either wavefront guided or topo guided, that you could begin to fix the problem eyes, you know? And, and, and that's not, the company didn't care about that because they, they were looking for volume of a market and they said, we want to deliver a new product that, you know, everyone would treat and then we get market share. Um, but for the doctors, what they cared about is what about my patient who has an irregular astigmatism and there's nothing I can do for him? You know, I can't plug in values. Is there some customized treatment that now I could fix these eyes? And then my whole safety profile for doing laser vision correction is much better because if there's an unexpected irregularity, I can fix that. I can now use this customized method to fix that. That, that was the power of what Wavefront Guided first did and then Topography Guide is contributing. What we learned over a course of time is that Wavefront Guided, um, even though it gives the whole optics of the, of the whole eye, which is perceived to be the best for making these corrections, the minute you start changing the cornea in a customized way, the, the, the rays that, that go inside the eye are now going in completely different directions. And so it's, it's a moving target. As you're treating, you're creating this moving target. So then the wavefront information, especially in a highly irregular eye, is gonna be completely different um, by the time you're done with the surgery. And, and that's, that was sort of the, the, the part of it that didn't make wavefront really work well for treating irregular eyes. Topo Guided had the bigger hope to say, okay, here we have, the cornea, which is the major refracting structure in the eye. If we can make the cornea regular, assuming that not, there's not too much irregularity inside the eye, we should be able to get a good outcome, especially in a highly abnormal eye. And I've used um, topo guided treatments on some previously treated eyes with some pretty good success. Problem there is the predictability of coma and spherical aberration in higher values and how you can control and treat that is not, uh, is not that easy to figure out. You know, what you put in, you might think you're in the right direction and yet you're missing it because those values are really influencing. And, and I think forcities might help, but forcities is not designed for highly regular corneas. So that's probably a disclaimer. It's like, we're doing this for virgin eyes because you know, but when, once you do those more greater aberrations, you get bigger taluses, we don't know how predictable that's going to be. 
the, the new hope in my mind, and I'm working with Innovise right now, Innovise is ray tracing guided topic, uh, you know, ray tracing guided customized treatment. It's taking the internal data and biometry to sort of iterate those changes of, of where the rays are gonna go once you start treating the eye. And I, I think it's, it's creating kind of almost like a model eye or an eye avatar for every single eye you treat instead of using a gold strand model, which works, but is not perfect with these highly irregular eyes. And so I think there might be a hope that Innovise will actually help us to do a better job on some of these highly irregular eyes. But again, Alcon, when they release that product, they're gonna say, this is just for virgin eyes. It's gonna be up to the surgeons to begin using it and seeing how versatile it is in taking care of the highly irregular eyes. Yes, uh, one final question. Uh, recently, we, we saw a paper on correcting coma with spherical lenses. Uh, when we see all these, let's say, uniform ablations and patients with astigmatism in coma and the way to correct astigmatism may be the same as to correct coma, what is your uh, thoughts about this. What is the ability of a cylindrical lens to correct coma? We always that, uh, had this discussion, uh, Wallace and myself, about one thing is astigmatism, another thing is coma. And this paper brought us the discussion that you may be able to correct both with the same kind of lens. Yes, well, when you have a lot of coma, um, you can do your best correction of somebody with, you know, with just sphere and cylinder by putting the axis uh, of the, of the, of the uh, cylinder treatment, you know, kind of uh, just, uh, how should I say it? It's not cutting through the coma, it's actually just, you know, centrally, you know, kind of uh, parallel to the coma. Uh, and that seems to be the, the way the optics work. Just like spherical aberration changes the sphere when you, when you treat it, so coma changes the cylinder. And I, I showed that one example in my talk where yes. the manifest and the topo was very different, you know, and it was because of coma. And it was a 2.75 difference in, in what the two were saying because of coma. So coma can sometimes be very large especially in the highly irregular eyes. Um, I just had uh, Guy Kazarian, who is doing a lot with refractive surgery. He just visited me yesterday and we were just chatting and he came in, saw me do th these cases I was presenting today. Uh, and we were talking a little bit and he says, you know, you're using forcities, but we've used artificial intelligence to look at coma and spherical aberration and come up with our own geometric planning for Contura, you know, mm -hmm. as part of his data link. Now I have not used that as of yet, but now I'm curious. Uh, he's worked with Michael Marochin on that to kind of come up with some of it. And instead of maybe doing all the geometric optics and there's a lot of planning, they're using some more simple methods to look at coma and spherical aberration off of the maps with artificial intelligence to sort of help say, this is what the ablation profile would be. And he says, you know, he's getting some reasonable uptake on that method. So Forcities isn't the only thing that's out there. There's other things. I just don't have any experience with it yet. I just heard about it. And I, and I, I think your question about coma, he, he kind of talked about how coma is a big player that way. And I, I could see that for sure. Uh, Vinicius, I'll ask for, uh, show us the, the results for the other and then, uh, I'll call Dr. Brenner, who had raised his hand as well. But please uh, finish okay. the presentation and we'll move on. Okay, the treatment for the left eye. So we've approached with the same systematic and put it in the laser, the pachymetry, papillometry, and the subject refraction. And for this one, we've proceeded with a mechanical dip And 
the profile ablation was uneventful. And the four months post-op, the patient had uncorrected visual acuity of 20 over 20 and did not accept any residual refraction. So, um, yes. Because of that, uh, an expected result uh, from, our, from the right eye, we opted to uh, do a mechanical uh, deposition of the left eye uh, with a blunt knife. And the result was, was quite satisfactory. And uh, despite the astigmatism, the TMR was quite different from the, the manifest refraction. We sticked it to uh, the manifest refraction and the treatment was uh, successful. Um, uh, Dr. Brenner, uh, would you like to comment? You had raised your hand previously. Yes, thank you. Um, I was just wondering the first I, if um, what kind of uh, strategy to centrate the treatment and the cyclotorsion control? This was my first uh, impression about the first eye. Uh, do you use uh, vertex centration? Do you use cyclotorsion control? Because this patient has a uh, very, very large pupil offset. If you see here, this pupillary center is 0 0.45. Uh, so first, what kind of uh, centration and uh, the cyclotorsion control? And of course, the platform of uh, wave light, it was not uh, done to trans PRK cases. It's uh, two procedures, uh, which is not uh, doing, which not done at a single step. So it's not uh, optimized for this kind of treatment. And regarding the discussion with uh, Dr. Mauro Campos uh, and the treatment of coma and spheric aberration, I think that the wave light platform, it's a little bit some uh, fixed. You don't have many options to try to understand what kind of uh, refraction we're going to induce with the treatment of uh, irregularities. Uh, because we are discussing here way, uh, spheric aberration and coma but uh, you don't address this kind of uh, aberrations with this topo guided ablation. We have, with the wave light platform, we have just this, the total amount of irregularities, but you cannot address those components uh, alone. And it's difficult to understand what kind of uh, refraction we're going to induce with this platform. It, it's not so flexible as the Schwind platform, for example. And my last thing, uh, Dr. Damian Gatinel is trying to uh, sell, on, in a way, the new classification, uh, wavefront classification that maybe can include the defocus component in the, co in the spherical aberration component and the astigmatism component in the, the coma component. What, when, or is this new classification um, maybe suitable for treatments? And uh, what's the impression of Dr. Kruger about this? Thank you, thank you yeah. for your attention. Yeah, no, thank you. Your, your comments are, are, I think, very relevant. You know, you wanna make sure you can uh, prevent cyclo rotation because then then you're gonna then you'll be creating new aberrations somewhere else you know if your cylinder's off because of cyclo rotation um, in terms of Damien um, and his work with a new wavefront classification um, I like it I, I like what he's come up with I think it's really bright and it makes sense because it's it's separating those individual aberration components in a way that you can understand them better. You know, the, the way that Zernike uh, components work now, um, your sphere and your spherical aberration are interdependent with each other. You know, spherical aberration is going to affect the, the sphere term because there is a spherical value in the spherical aberration. It's not just pure spherical aberration. So that's where you have to kind of make all these additional factors. It's the same with coma and astigmatism. You know, coma in a Zernike profile has some astigmatism built into it. 
in the way it's classified. And what Damien is sort of coming up with is, is a methodology for saying, no, this is just pure coma with no, none of that cylinder built in. And I think that's a more purest way to say, okay, if it's pure coma and I treat only coma, I know I'm not gonna be creating anything else like new astigmatism because of the cylinder was in it. Um, I'm hoping that what he does might kind of be picked up by some of the, some of the science and leadership in the field to begin to have those classifications in treatments and in the measuring devices that they have. I think the way to, to do that is to just challenge the people in the company to say, can you adopt, adopt this maybe as a parallel platform? Because the change overnight, people would not like it. You know, I'm used to Zernike, I'm working with it, and now there's something new, I don't know if I like it. But if you had both, then you could compare and you could learn it. And if it really was gonna be substantial, people would shift over to the new classification. Does that answer your question? Absolutely, thank you, thank you very much. I'm totally agree with that. Oh, uh, we are almost 20 minutes ahead of our time. So I'll apologize for that, but I'll ask, we'll finish this uh, case discussion here and I ask for any final remarks. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank once again for uh, our colleagues in the US for participating in this session, uh, especially our special guest, uh, Professor Roland Kruger. And thank you once again for your attention and your uh, disposal of, of being able to, to discuss these cases uh, fabulously. And as I said before, we wish we had uh, seen your uh, great lecture before these cases as well. Uh, thanks once again. I wish everyone a great weekend, a great day, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you once again, Thank Dr. You, Felipe, and, and hopefully we can have more dialogue once you start using Forcities more in the future. Sure, I, I hope so as well. Okay, have a great day, everyone. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.